Tampa Bay is a mysterious, ancient seaport with a rich, old world history. This video will be covering the unexplained phenomena of Tampa and its surrounding areas. Phenomena such as 99% quartz crystal beach sand, unexplained underground tunnel networks, and the possible location of the Garden of Eden, as well as pirates, Moorish architecture, and robber barons. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida Baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. It's a grand old 1925 home on the Hillsborough River. There is a basement that, uh, surprisingly enough... But what uh, lies below is something to see. It looks like uh, it must have been closed with gates. Some believe it was a brothel or a cockfighting ring. It must have been stairs. Now it's home to Marina, you can come in. <laughs> who showed us the tunnels that are now blocked. One is said to lead to Ybor City, the other under the river. A former neighbor told her. He actually walked through one of the tunnels, the one that goes under the river, and he kept walking for 20 minutes. And uh, he couldn't find the end, so he got scared and came back. It's a mystery who came and went, doing what? Underground. Maybe a window to pass money through, or booze. On this side of the window, compartments, maybe to hold bets or bottles. So they would do it down here? Yeah. It's a treasure trove for Tampa mob historian Scott Ditchie, who's been digging into Tampa's underground. When the tunnels were uncovered in Ebor a month ago, I think it just really blew open all this interest in the topic. Behind the, the woods, there was a passage. Moving up from below, Marina says this staircase was once hidden. It leads to a lookout tower. Keep in mind that this was all land. With a view of what was a very active river. Especially from the time period the house was built, having tunnels on the Hillsborough River was, was right in the heart of Prohibition. And this whole area, uh, Tampa all the way down through Ybor City, was a hotbed of, uh, of illegal rum running, bootlegging. And it's pretty obvious. And hiding money. The home supposedly has three safes. Marina has found only two so far. Justin. And then there's the blocked tunnels and their mystery. My husband says, if something has been locked, you need to find out why before you open it, you know? With new interest in what's underground, the old house on the river seems to hold even more mystery. Lloyd Sowers. Fox 13 News. It's damp and dark, just a couple of feet below the ground. The main tunnel runs from Ybor City toward the port, and it is truly a tunnel back in time. At a construction site off 6th Avenue, new openings just unearthed. Show the way. Gotta watch your head. We get inside for the first time. It, it, it keeps going. Seeing firsthand that the tunnels of Ybor aren't urban legend, they are real mysteries of history. And back in the day, you just know, you don't know what they had in mind for this. You got the storm structure that's right here. Intersecting pipes show drainage was at least part of the purpose, but there's little doubt there are also passages. For safety, this is just about as far as the construction manager will let us go. We can see about 200 feet. Where the tunnel leads, we just don't know. Some believe the tunnels were used for smuggling during Prohibition. In fact, the Florida brewery, built pre-1900, sat just above the tunnel. As these new entrances were unearthed, hundreds of bottles were found. Maybe a clue. We're going to kind of go back through time and, um, and kind of re-examine how these things might all connect. Using technology, the digital heritage team from USF went in to get images to make maps. There's where the brick ends. Of where the tunnels go in relation to streets and buildings above. We 
have the whole site to about a millimeter, so if something were to happen, we still have it all preserved digitally. What's likely to happen is the long lost tunnels of Ebor will be covered over again. It's right in the middle where we're going to be building our building, of course. The new building's owner, Daryl Shaw, says he'd like to build a see-through floor with a view of the tunnel. We've geo-referenced all of these maps. In the meantime, historians scour these tunnels of local legend. It goes up with, with all of the organized crime and all the other stories and, I hate to say myths, but the legends you hear about, about Ybor. In more than 100 years of Ybor City, the best kept secrets may be underground. Now the USF Libraries and the Tampa Bay History Center are gathering just as much data as they can while the tunnels are exposed. Was it used for smuggling, prostitution, organized crime, or all of the above? We could get more answers as they continue to dig deeper. Mark and Linda. I heard that it was just truthfully just a total underground network in Ebor City, or you could just go all over through an underground network. Even most customers at the Blue Ribbon Supermarket probably have no idea they are walking above a piece of history. The portal into the past is located behind the meat counter. I was the first one to go down and it was powdery and dry. 24 years ago, Sam Bobo was drilling through the floor when he discovered the underground chamber. I always said it must have been something they didn't want anybody to find. I mean, that was just my own, you know, uh, but I'm, I don't know. I wouldn't even want to guess. I'm not as small as they used to be. Today, the underground is filled with debris. We went down with Sam's nephew, Mike. Well, you, you go up about 25, about 30 feet up here, and then it leads you to a, uh, a hallway. There are at least two tunnels leading in different directions. One of the tunnels has apparently collapsed or been filled in with dirt. I dug and found nothing. Just a little dirty. Then Mike led us to the back tunnel that leads under 7th Avenue. What do you think could be on the other side? There's, there's no telling. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to find out. The Bobos say they've been told the room is used for gambling. The tunnels were escape routes. Or they've heard it was used by a counterfeit ring. You know, I'm, I'm going to start taking these bricks out and we're going gonna, gonna to be with them just to see what's under all this stuff. I don't know. I think it's pretty neat. Ybor City has a rich and colorful history from gambling to gangsters, but not all of Ybor City's history is visible from above ground. There are tunnels, believe it or not, and hidden rooms under Ybor's streets that few people have ever seen. Tonight, News Channel 8's Jeff Patterson takes us under Ybor. There's the Ybor City you can see and the Ybor City you can't see. Under my feet is history. I was the first one to go down there. In 1994, I went under Ebor, under what was then the Blue Ribbon Supermarket. I found large rooms and tunnels. And then it leads you to a, uh, a hallway. One tunnel led down 7th Avenue, but was filled in with debris. Another tunnel led under 7th Avenue to a nightclub across the street. And the tunnels were an intricate part of the history of Ebor in the prohibition days. Wallace Reyes is a social anthropologist, historian, and author who has studied and written about the tunnels. And those cellars were connecting. And that's where the way that they transfer liquid from one building to the next without much complication to go above. But Reyes had never seen under the Blue Ribbon supermarket until I showed him my story. Unfortunately, when the Blue Ribbon was destroyed by fire in the year 2000, the tunnels and rooms were filled in. But Reyes knows of other tunnels. Well, supposedly, this here is a tunnel no more than three feet. The tunnel led from the cigar factory to the old Gonzales Clinic across the street. On one side of the clinic, underground, the morgue. On the other, a secret door. But if you go to the right, you knock the door, and it's a big easy. Reyes took me to one more special place, the only tunnel he knows of still in use in Ebor. Right now, we are nine feet on the ground. Showing me a special part of the city. So do you think the rooms that I was in under Blue Ribbon at one time more or less looked like this? Possible, yes. Mr. Reyes even gives walking tours of Ebor City with detailed stories about this area's colorful past. In Ebor, Jeff Patterson, News Channel 8.
This week, new construction uncovered one of the coolest things ever. I love this story. Uh, Ivor City Secret Past, an old tunnel has been uncovered. Yeah, this is cool. We showed you another section of the tunnel just a few weeks ago, and News Channel 8's Jeff Patterson first went into Ebor's tunnels back in 1994, and he went back underground today. There's not a lot of places in Florida where you can go underground in a basement, but right now I'm underground in a basement in Florida and leading back this way, tunnels in the darkness. Oh, God, it could be anything. I mean, prohibition, there was, you know, just, I mean, any time you want to move anything, I guess just to hide from people, you'd go underground. Until recently, Casey Corwin owned a building on this property and knew there was a basement. With the basement in there, I was always down there trying to figure out what was going on. She sold her building, and new construction uncovered a long hidden section of tunnel. But the tunnels that I've seen that are here in, on our property are about seven feet wide, seven feet high, and have a flat floor that's dirt. The discovery of the tunnel is not a surprise to architect Jerry Kurtz. His firm owns a building next door that was once part of the Florida Brewing Company. This was one of the most historic sites in Hillsborough County, we believe. Kurtz says the brewery operated even during Prohibition. Their main client was Cuba. Kurtz knows there's a basement under his building, and he took me there. You have to realize, in Florida, there aren't a lot of basements, so this is kind of rare. Kurtz has his own theory about the use of the tunnels because of the location of the brewery. So if you want to get beer out, during Prohibition, an easy way to do that is with tunnels, and several of the tunnels come to, came to our basement. There are many tunnels in Ebor and many potential uses. I first encountered the tunnels of Ebor in 1994, when we explored under the old Blue Ribbon supermarket and crawled under 7th Avenue. And then it leads you to a, uh, a hallway. So the tunnels that were uncovered this week in Ebor are just part of what is purported to be a network of tunnels under Ebor. Maybe more yet to be uncovered. Jeff Patterson, News Channel 8. The Tampa Bay Hotel is an exceptionally large brick and poured concrete building constructed in Moorish Revival style. The hotel's six minarets, four cupolas, and three domes were all made from solid stainless steel. It was allegedly built by Henry B. Plant between 1888 and 1891. Henry Plant was the founder of the Plant System, a network of trains and steamboats throughout the Southeast United States. We all know that steam energy played a large role in the old world. Interestingly, Standard Oil co-founder and railroad magnate Henry Flagler had just completed his Moorish masterpiece, Ponce de Leon Hotel, in the year 1887, on the other side of the state. For those that don't know, Plant laid all the railroad on the west coast of Florida, and Flagler laid all the railroad on the east coast of Florida. These two tycoons were friends, yet we are told they were rivals. It seems to me that they were both following the same insidious master plan. It is difficult to ignore the significance of their names, Plant and Flagler. Plant, flag, as in planting the flag. Interestingly, the Tampa Bay Hotel was the first hotel in Florida to have both electricity and a telephone in every single room. What makes this incredible is that the hotel had 511 rooms. To illustrate, the first hotel in Florida to have all of its rooms fully powered had not 5, 10, or even 20 rooms, but over 500, each requiring their own wiring, electricity, phone lines, etc. Additionally, the Tampa Bay Hotel had the first ever elevator installed in Florida. Believe it or not, this elevator was constructed so well that it is still operational and remains in use today. This is rather hard to believe. This also mirrors the fact that Flagler's Ponce de Leon Hotel was the first building in the country to be wired with electricity from construction. I will read from nationalparkservices.gov. The hotel sat on 150 manicured acres. On the grounds, guests could enjoy a golf course, tennis, and shuffleboard courts, billiards, a casino with a 2,000-seat auditorium, a racetrack, a flower conservatory, 
stables, and places for wild game hunting, fresh and saltwater fishing, sailing, rowing, and canoeing. There is also a freshwater spring on the grounds that feeds a small river. Breathtaking old world architecture and water seem to be inextricably connected, not to mention the various alleged locations for the real fountain of youth scattered around the Tampa Bay area. I think it should be noted here that St. Petersburg, Florida is only a short distance across the bay from Tampa. Is it merely a coincidence that in both St. Petersburg, Florida and St. Petersburg, Russia, we find Islamic-influenced architecture? It must also be a coincidence that Muscovy ducks found in Florida bear the same name as Muscovy, the region in Russia. This is where the word Moscow comes from. Interestingly, we find the seemingly Moorish Seminoles of Florida to be descended from the Muscogee tribe, very similar to Muscovy, phonetically speaking. Muscovy in Russia, Muscogee in Florida. It is my opinion that the Muscogees were referred to by other names such as Creek, Seminole, etc., in order to obscure their non-American origin. If you haven't watched my videos on the Moors of Florida, the links are in the description. Please note that the Moors were called Barbarians, and the Muscovies were called Tartarians. It is no coincidence that after the conclusion of the Barbary Wars, the United States Navy turned its sights on South Florida, while the Army would become involved in the Florida Seminole Wars. And again, it is no coincidence that the U.S. Navy's enemies were labeled pirates in both Moorish North Africa and the coasts of Florida. Tampa Bay is the American city most associated with piracy and buccaneers. It is my opinion these wars were being waged against the last remnants of the Moors, the mixed-race descendants of the Phoenicians. It should be noted that many of these Moorish Seminoles escaped to Cuba. Unsurprisingly, the next international conflict the U.S. would participate in, the Spanish-American War, took place in and around Cuba. The Tampa Bay Hotel was the unofficial headquarters for the duration of this little-known war. I will read from nationalparkservices.gov. The United States government chose Tampa as the official port of embarkation for American forces headed to Cuba because of its geographical location, deep water port, and connection to Henry V. Plant. With his railroad line, his ships, his lobbying and connections to the War Department, and his massive Tampa Bay Hotel. Colonel Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders were among the 30,000 soldiers who arrived in Tampa Bay by the late spring of 1898. The U.S. military set up seven army camps in the Tampa area and made the Tampa Bay Hotel headquarters for the army officers planning the war campaign. The Tampa Bay Hotel became the hub of war preparation activity, with a train that came right up to its west side. Troops, officers, and officials constantly came and went. The train took them to the port of Tampa, only nine miles away, to handle cargo and supplies. Inside the luxurious hotel, the generals planned their war campaign. Considering Cuba's subsequent relationship with the Soviet Union, another connection to Russia emerges between Old World Florida and Tartaria. For those that don't know, Fidel Castro was a Jesuit. The Jesuits actually took administrative control of Tampa in 1888 after a supposed outbreak of yellow fever killed off the previous Catholic clergy. They then allegedly erected Sacred Heart Church in Tampa between 1898 and 1905. The church is made of solid granite and marble with a 135-foot dome. Its pews and doors are made from solid oak. The church's 70 stained glass windows were allegedly made in Germany but shipped to Florida. Strangely, the Jesuits gave up the rights to the Tampa area in 2005 on the 100th anniversary of the church's founding. 
the Moorish-influenced Detroit Hotel was also allegedly constructed in 1888. In an unbelievable turn of events, a hidden elevator was recently discovered inside the hotel. This elevator, believed to be the second in the state, after the Tampa Bay Hotel, remained unnoticed until 2020. After more than a hundred years of continuous occupation, it is made largely of gold and other precious materials. This goes to show just how easily a hidden civilization could be hiding right under our noses. Construction workers tearing down the walls inside the former Detroit Hotel recently uncovered an elevator at least 115 years old. The birdcage exterior and huge electric motor are still there, as well as the cables, though they were cut a long time ago. So that stuff's been entombed for decades. Frank Segretti is converting the former Caddy's restaurant on Central to the Brickyard, a casual dining venue. Now the elevator was a surprise. And the more we tore apart, the more excited we got, until a point where we demoed half the building. The Detroit Hotel was built in 1888 by developer Peter Demons. The 40-room hotel was three and a half stories high with a 70-foot tower and had spectacular views of Tampa Bay. It was the first hotel built in the unincorporated village that would become St. Petersburg, and it was the pride of the Lower Peninsula. Even stranger, the original switchboard for the hotel, also from the late 1800s, was rediscovered. It was so old that it was actually made from wood. The Hillsborough County Courthouse was allegedly constructed in 1892, but demolished in 1952 for unclear reasons. Considering it was constructed in the same fashion as the Tampa Bay Hotel, there is no reason why it could not still stand today. Oddly, the glorious stainless steel dome was spared demolition and serves as a gazebo today. Here is an obelisk outside the courthouse, also from the late 19th century. Egmont Key Lighthouse is the oldest original structure in the Tampa Bay area. Despite being allegedly moved a total of 90 feet inland following damage by a hurricane in 1848, this reconstruction took place in 1858. I find this also hard to believe. The Sulphur Springs Water Tower was allegedly completed in 1927. Its purpose was to supply water pressure to nearby areas. Constructed of solid concrete, it stands 214 feet tall, with a foundation extending 45 feet into the ground, which rests directly on bedrock. Construction photos show what could be progress, but could also be the remnants of a pre-existing or damaged structure. Regardless, this tower is widely believed to be haunted by the ghosts of many people who commit suicide there. Siesta Key, Florida, just south of Tampa Bay, has a beach unlike any other in the world. While normal beach sand is comprised of crushed shells and coral, the shimmering white sand of Siesta Key is 99% quartz crystal. To make things more bizarre, the source of this 4 million year old deposit of crystal sand is believed to be the Appalachian Mountains, about 500 miles away. The old world implications of an entire beach made from mysterious crystal sand should be quite obvious. I will be diving deeper into the quartz sand of Siesta Key in a later video. I also wanted to briefly touch on Tarpon Springs, Florida, just outside of Tampa. There is a controversial, yet somewhat mythical man who calls Tarpon Springs home. His name is John Saxer. He is a direct descendant of the Vaughn Sachs branch of the Merovingian line. This bloodline is the wellspring for many of medieval Europe's royal families, but can be traced back to the pharaohs of Egypt and Isaac from the Old Testament. Saxer, who claims to be the rightful king of Switzerland, and the god Neptune incarnate, claims the area north of St. Petersburg, Florida to be the original Garden of Eden. He has somewhat substantiated his claim by the legitimate discovery of more than 2,000 ancient stone anchors across the west coast of Florida. 
most of which display mysterious holes bored straight through them. These stones are nearly identical to ancient anchors found in the Mediterranean Sea and elsewhere, yet are given little to no attention by mainstream academia. Their reluctance to investigate these anchors may be due to the fact that many of them weigh thousands of pounds and could never be manually moved, let alone lifted by men. He has also discovered what he believes to be a stone entrance to the underworld in Tarpon Springs, the center of the true Garden of Eden. I will be diving deeper into Mr. Saxer's legend in a later video as well. And lastly, the Ringling Brothers decided to headquarter their circus in Sarasota, Florida in the 1920s. If you haven't watched my video on the elephants of Florida, the link is in the description. John Ringling, the ringleader, allegedly constructed a Moorish-influenced Venetian mansion in Sarasota in 1925. He is also said to have built Hotel Verona, a building that sticks out like a sore thumb and strangely features multiple doors to nowhere on its exterior. Back now with that massive sinkhole wreaking havoc in Florida over the weekend. Two homes destroyed after the ground just opened up. ABC's newest correspondent, Victor Okendo, is near the scene in Lando Lakes, Florida. Good morning, Victor. Good morning, Robin. Crews have been very busy. One of the first things they did, set up a perimeter. They put this fence up. They took down part of it to give us a better look this morning. And as you take a look, there's that sinkhole just feet away from where we're standing. And now as we look above from our drone, you can see all the debris inside part of the house that's left standing, that green bathroom, all that roofing, even a boat, and crews are being told they have to wait a few more days until they start the cleanup process. This morning, a massive sinkhole just north of Tampa, Florida, swallowing and destroying two homes. Watch the moment neighbors capture this roof come crashing down. The sinkhole now stable, officials say. Five homes remain evacuated, but now the big concern, water contamination. Officials testing the drinking water of at least 15 homes in the area. How long before life returns to some kind of sense of normalcy? We're probably looking at several months before we can get this back to situation normal for these folks. Pasco County emergency officials calling it the biggest sinkhole in at least three decades. The gaping sinkhole is 225 feet wide and 50 feet deep. You can see from our drone all that's left of a bathroom, roofing, and even a boat. A disaster area now filled with mud, sewage and toxic debris. I see a big hole and I see a lake and I see that we're in the middle of it and that's probably not a good thing. Sinkholes occur when limestone underground gets eaten away by water, creating a cave and the weight above becomes too heavy. Eventually the arch roof gets so thin that it can't handle the weight of what's above it. While this one outside Tampa is unusually large, 
sinkholes are a common problem in Florida, more than 3,500 spread across the state. According to the United States Geological Survey, over the last 15 years, sinkholes cost at least $300 million in damage per year on average nationally. However, since there is no nationwide tracking of sinkholes, they believe that number may actually be higher. The water levels have come down by a few feet, but there's actually a car that's sitting underneath the surface that might be plugging the sinkhole. The cleanup process will take some heavy equipment, dump trucks, possibly even cranes, and officials want to make sure that the ground is stable before they get that process going. It will likely be months before this area is back to normal. Robin? All right, Victor, thanks so much. Every time I see a video like mm -hmm. that. Park right there on the corner of 16th Street and Columbus. The J.C. Newman factory built in 1910 is under renovation. They're going to open a cigar museum, but they never expected to find what lies beneath. It's been known for generations as El Rejo, the cigar factory with the clock. Its renovation is revealing. What good shape these bricks are in. But as third generation cigar maker Eric Newman discovered. This is our whole museum. This first floor is going to be. What you see at first may not be the whole story of the old cigar factory. During the, the uh, 1930s, there was had a cigar city mafia in town. Every cigar factory got robbed. But at this cigar factory, he says, they had a plan. And we learned that when this place was robbed, the general manager would go down a secret set of stairs. He showed us where workers discovered it under the floor. These are a sick, hidden set of stairs. The stairs lead down to a storage room, an old door, long hidden. This is a vault, a secret vault. This is the room where you think that a general manager might have come to hide the money. Right, come down those steps, come around, and this is this because this is a safe place. This is a, this is a vault. It appears okay. to be another example of letters, Ebor's letters underground secrets. Got to watch your head. Like the Ebor tunnels we discovered a year ago, there's no certainty of exactly what went on underground. It must have been the Wild West. But Newman says it's real Tampa history in a lost room beneath the stairs. Look at these records. I mean, only God knows what's in them. Secrets now revealed. Because there's a story. Beneath the floor, beneath the old clock in Ebor City. We know that old hotels often have ghost stories, so old cigar factories may have their own tales of old. Either way, that staircase will be one of the exhibits in their new cigar museum. J.C. Newman hopes to have it open by February.